Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Farr coming to you live for Bible in a Year, Day 48 of 365. So excited to be live with all of you at our regular time, 515 Pacific Standard Time. Trying to be with you daily at that time. Lately, I know it's been a little bit of a challenge to be able to go live at exactly 515, but today we made it. Crown Point writer, Naomi, you're here from Australia. Glad that you're here. Glad that both of you can join me for Bible in a Year, Day 48. Okay, so I'm going to do this right off the top of the video. As you know, you can start the Bible in a Year challenge any day of the year from day one by going to the Pendleton Adventist Church YouTube channel, hitting subscribe, and starting from the Bible in a Year video one. And in the description on the video is included the daily Bible readings all the way from January 1, where we started in Genesis, Matthew, Psalm, and Proverbs all at the same time. Friends, it is never too late to be a part of our Bible in a Year challenge. And so, I want to challenge you to jump in with both feet, get involved in this challenge, start praying daily for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life and spending time daily in God's Word. Because, friends, the greatest thing that we can do is to live lives of prayer, praise, and devotion to God. We want to live our lives like that because, friends, when we're spending time daily in God's Word, we are going to be changed from glory to glory to be more like Jesus. And what did He promise us? He said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men and women to myself. Friends, not only was Jesus lifted up on the cross to die, for you and I so that we could have forgiveness for sin, but so that we could also receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples just before he left planet Earth, he said, hey, I'm going to my Father in heaven. It is to your benefit that I do so because I am sending you another, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Peace, who will be with you, who will lead you into all truth, and who will use you to teach that same truth, the Word of God, to others. And so definitely we want to be a part of that. Okay, so today is 48. Day 48 of 365. Only two days away from 50 days into our Bible reading challenge. Can you believe it? Congratulations to all of you who are still doing this thing. Congratulations to all of you who are just starting this thing. Because guess what? It doesn't matter when we start, it matters that we start. Okay, and so today is the 17th of February, meaning it is day 48, because we had 31 days in January, and now today is day 17 of February, day 48 of 365 for our Bible in a Year reading challenge, and here we are. You are joining Pastor Stephen Farr on his Instagram Live at 515. Yeah, here we go. And today we read Leviticus 4, verse 1 through 519, Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through chapter 3, verse 6, Psalm 36, 1 through 12, and Proverbs 10, 1 and 2. But before we dive in, before we dive in to our scripture readings for today, let's just pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to be present with us and to guide the comments that I make. And also today, while I'm sharing, please let me know which Bible verse, out of everything that you read for today, which Bible verse is the verse that you are claiming? Which promise, which scripture are you claiming as a promise for your life today? Please put that in the chat. Let's go ahead and pray and let's get started. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to come together, to read your word, to allow you to inspire us, Lord, for us to see things in your word that we've never seen before, for us to be able to learn more about you, to grow in our relationship with you, to be able to claim promises that we find together in your word, and also to begin to incorporate into our lives the things that we are learning together Lord, we want your word to come alive in our life. We want your word to be living in and through us. We want others to know you by seeing your word, the seed of your word growing in our life so that we can become more and more like you and that people can see you 
as you are lifted up in our lives. And so we just want to thank you for being present today as we study together in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, where two or more are gathered together in his name, he is there in the midst. So excited that each of you are with me tonight for the Bible in a Year reading challenge. We are on day 48 of 365, as I previously mentioned. And let's start today by discussing the reading that we did in the book of Leviticus. We started in chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, and we went all the way through 519. Now, there's something that I noticed right away. There is something that I noticed right away in Leviticus chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, let's go ahead and read this together. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally, in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, and does any one of them. If it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bring, bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Okay, so we went through this, and it starts off with the priest. If the priest should unintentionally sin, what has to be done? Well, it says, this is, the, this is the interesting thing. If the priest sins, he brings sin on all of the people. Whoa. If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done and does the, any one of them, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Friends, how many of you can raise your hand and say that it would feel almost nigh impossible to keep all of the commands that the Lord had asked the people to keep? As you're reading through Exodus, as you're reading through Leviticus, as you're seeing how the Lord is telling them to do all of these things, any of you feeling like it's very possible that you would unintentionally break the law of God by just not even knowing it? Here's the thing that we see here. It says if anyone sins unintentionally, they still need to offer a sacrifice. So many of us sin. So many of us break God's law. Because sadly, it is our natural tendency to break God's law. And many of us sin and break God's law ignorantly. We don't even know that we're doing it. But does that change the outcome? Does that change the fact, what we see here in Leviticus, does it change the fact when people unintentionally sin and they break one of the Lord's commandments, does that mean that there doesn't need to be a sacrifice? Of course not. What we see is, if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any one of them, then it starts off. If it's the anointed priest who sins, he brings guilt on all of the people. Therefore, he must bring a guilt offering to the Lord, a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Even an unintentional sin brings the curse of death. Romans 3.23 All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So friends, when we sin, even unintentionally, there still has to be payment made for that sin. So many of us sin, we break God's law. Sadly, it is our natural tendency to break God's law unless we are born again 
by the Holy Spirit of God. Even still, we need grace, don't we? We need Christ's righteousness, don't we? We need Christ's righteousness on our behalf. Now, what I love about this Leviticus reading is it starts with the high priest, doesn't it? If anyone sins unintentionally and if it's the high priest, he brings guilt on all of the people. Then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Right? And then it goes on. It says, if the entire congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandment ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bowl from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. And the elders of the congregation shall all lay their hands on the head of the bowl before the Lord, and the bowl shall be killed before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall bring some of the blood of the bowl into the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is in the tent of meeting before the Lord. And the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Right? And the priest shall make atonement for them and they shall be forgiven. And he shall carry the bowl outside the camp and burn it up as he burned the first bowl. It is the sin offering for the assembly. Okay, here's the beautiful thing. Ultimately, the fact that you notice, notice something. When the high priest sins, what does he have to do? He brings sin against the whole congregation, so he has to go on behalf of the people to offer the bull to make them right before God again. If the entire congregation sins, there's a difference. All of the elders, the leaders of the different tribes, come together and lay their hand on the bull, and then the high priest takes the sacrifice before God, and then, what does it say? It says, and the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. Who is this pointing to? Can anyone tell me what this ceremony that Jesus is having them do over and over and over again, who is it pointing to? And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. Who is this pointing to? I'm going to wait until some of you respond to the chat. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. And he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it up. As he burned the first bull, it is the sin offering for the assembly. Notice something. The bull is taken outside the camp. Do you know that Jesus was taken outside the city to Golgotha to be hung on the cross as an atonement for our sins? Friends, here's the thing. Why would the Lord be telling Moses to tell the people that any unintentional breaking of the law that they did was still considered sin, and when they realized that they had sinned, they'd have to offer a sacrifice? It's because Jesus knew the condition of humanity. He knew that we are all sinners. He knew that the people could not keep the law. He knew that the people would need a sacrifice. He knew that the people would need a sacrifice made on their behalf so that they could be forgiven. And so through the tabernacle ceremonies, through the sacrifices for sin, even the unintentional sin, the people were beginning to see, no matter how much we try to keep God's law, we break it even unintentionally, and then we have to bring sacrifices before God, and the high priest brings the sacrifice to the altar, and sprinkles the blood against the altar, and pours the blood around the base of the altar, and he burns the rest of the sin offering outside the camp and the priest makes atonement for them and they are forgiven. And some of you said it in the chat. The ceremonies are pointing to Jesus. The tabernacle on earth, the temple on earth, points to the temple in heaven where Jesus, our high priest, is answering our prayers. It says, if you are faithful and just to repent of your sin... He is faithful and just to what? Forgive you of your sin. It is Jesus who is making atonement for us. 
It is Jesus who is interceding for us. It is Jesus who hears our prayers when we repent for the intentional and the unintentional sin in our life. Jesus is the one who makes us right before God the Father. It is Jesus, our high priest, that makes atonement for us. And as a result, we are forgiven. But I'd never noticed this before, that the bowl is carried outside the camp and it is burned up. It is a sin offering for the assembly. Just like Jesus was taken outside the city and crucified on Golgotha, the bowl for the sin offering for the congregation was taken outside the camp to be burned. Everything that these people were doing in response to their unintentional sin, their intentional sin was not only showing them their need for a Savior, but it was also pointing them to the Savior and exactly what he would do to make atonement for them, to set them free from the slavery of sin once for all. you got to love these readings in Leviticus and how they point us to Jesus. Check this out. When a leader sins, doing unintentionally any of all of the things that by the commandments of the Lord, his God ought not to be done, and he realizes his guilt, or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he has to bring as his offering a goat, a male without blemish, and shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. Okay. We can keep going over this, but as you see, each one of these different descriptions of the offering that has to be given are description descriptions of unintentional sin, right? Now, here's something that I want to point out that's very interesting in Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1. Okay, listen to this. If anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. What is this talking about? Well, I actually looked it up. And here's what it says. It says that what this is pointing to is failure to keep one's word. Okay, this does not refer to a conversation, but to a solemn confirmation of a promise to do or to refrain from doing certain things. When men or women entered into a contract or covenant, there was a mutual agreement, and this agreement they often confirmed with an oath. If one of the contracting parties forgets his promise, which he confirmed by an oath, or deliberately repudiates it, when he knoweth of it, then he will be guilty. In other words, this is saying, listen, you guys, if you make a covenant between each other, if you make an agreement between each other and you don't keep it, you are guilty of committing the sin against the person that you made the agreement with. And here's what it says. Failure to keep one's word is a flagrant sin of our times and appears to be on the increase. Of this, Christians must be aware. It is easy to fall in with the ways of the world and to become slack in the standard God has set. What is this saying? It's saying, Christians... When you make a promise to someone, you need to keep your word. We need to be people who keep our word. Let your yes be your yes, and your no be your no. And so here's what it says in verse 4. If anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear, and it is hidden from him, when he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt in any of these, when he realizes his guilt in any of these and confess, 
the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin. Friends, can I advise you of something? First of all, don't make evil oaths. And second of all, the Bible in a way is counseling us against making rash oaths, even if they're good. Listen to this. If anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good. Okay, so if you make an oath to God, whether it is a good thing or a bad thing, this is saying, if you don't keep it, you've sinned. And so we have to be careful. Why bring guilt upon yourself by making an evil or a good oath that's rash, that's going to be hard for you to keep? Later on in God's word, we're actually going to read a story about a man who made a very rash oath. And then the consequences of that oath were very grave. Okay. And I want to tell you something. There's a reason why. In Leviticus chapter 5, God is making it possible for someone to receive forgiveness when they make an oath that is either good or bad that they're not going to be able to keep. It's because when we realize the guilt that we have as a result of the fact that we have made a rash oath between us and another person, between us and God, and we realize even a lot of times we make promises to God that we don't keep, right? Do we do it purposefully? No, we don't remember the promises we made. We go around swearing, oh God, I'll never do that again. I'll never do this again. Or I promise you I'm going to do this, right? God, I'm going to read my Bible every day and I'm never going to miss a day. Or God, I promise I'm going to pray more. Or God, I promise I'm going to be more generous. Or God, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. And we usually make promises to God when we're in trouble. Am I the only one? Things aren't going right. We know that we've totally messed up. We're paying the consequences for actions we have done. And then we make a rash oath to God. God, if you'll get me out of this one, I promise I will. God, if you get me out of this one, I promise I will never again. And here God is making a provision in his word for us to receive forgiveness even when we find ourselves making oaths between us and others or between us and God that we can't keep. He realizes that we are human beings. He realizes that we are fallible. He realizes that we make rash and crazy oaths between us and God and between us and other people. We don't even remember all of the oaths we make. And in a way, Leviticus is just trying to warn us against this practice. It's trying to warn us not to behave this way. You guys, it is hard enough to live a life, a good life, if we let Jesus and his righteousness be poured out in and through us. But friends, when we go around making promises and making oaths, the Bible tells us that we're expected to do it. If anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear... And it is hidden from him. What does that mean? It means that he forgets about it. She forgets about it. When he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt in any of these, when he or she realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. Okay, friends. What is this meaning in a contemporary context? It means if you realize that you're the kind of person who's constantly swearing things to your friends, your family, and others, or you're constantly swearing to God, I'm going to do this, or I won't do that anymore, stop that. Stop doing that. Here's why. Because you bring additional sin and guilt upon yourself for promising to do something that you're not capable of doing. Making promises both good and evil. Both pro and con is what that means. God, I will or God, I won't, right? Or you tell someone, I promise I will or I promise I never will again. 
and then you forget the promise you've made. Because usually we make these kinds of promises in distress, in a time of need, in a time of brokenness, in a time of pain, in a time of guilt, when we've already started suffering consequences for things that we shouldn't have done. And when we make these promises between us and God or between other people, we set ourselves up, A, to either break the con that contract knowingly, or B, to forget that we made that deal with God because we did it out of a place of emotion. We are making an emotional agreement between us and another person. If you'll forgive me, I promise you I never will. Or if you forgive me, I promise I will do this thing, right? Is this making sense to people, what I'm telling you? And so what God is saying here is, is that he realizes that we are broken, fallible people that are likely to make rash oaths and promises that we can't keep. And if we realize that we have done that, God even provides forgiveness for us then. Friends, God's mercy, God's love, God's grace is so amazing. Is anyone praising God right now as we are reading through Leviticus for the fact that Jesus came and he died for us so that we don't have to do all of these sacrifices anymore and so that we can pray and so that we can come to God and so that we can ask for forgiveness and Jesus, our high priest, can make atonement for us so that we can be forgiven before God the Father. It is such a beautiful thing that God has done for you and me to give us grace and mercy. Now, hold on just one second. I noticed there's like a, a glare on the camera. I'm just going to clean it off real quick. There we go. Maybe that's going to be a little bit better. Sorry when the lighting is not so great, friends. I'm doing my best here with my Samsung Galaxy 8 Plus. Pastor Far needs a new phone. Pray for me. Okay. Now, I want to get to the next part of Leviticus. Are you guys ready for some good news? I hope you're ready for some good news. Because I'm about ready to spit some good news. Are you ready for this? Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7. Leviticus 5, verse 7. Are you guys ready for some good news? The good news is this. God's mercy is extended to everyone. God's mercy is extended even to the poor. Because look what he has Moses share to the people in Leviticus 5, verse 7. But if he cannot afford a lamb... Then he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for sin that he has committed two turtle doves. Verse 10. Then he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the rule, and the priest shall make atonement for him for the sin that he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. Is there any difference in what comes out of this gift of two turtle doves? Or two pigeons? No, it says... And the priest shall make atonement for him in the sin that he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. If they couldn't afford the goat, if they couldn't afford the lamb, if they couldn't afford the bull, God says, you know what? If it's somebody that's poor, they can bring this offering, which would be much, much less expensive for them to bring. And guess what? The priest shall make atonement for him for the sin that he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's making it possible for all who come to him, rich and poor, black and white, male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, Greek and Roman, it don't matter. He's making it possible, rich or poor, for people to come to him. And then he says, okay, you know what? If you can't afford the two turtle doves, oh, I love this. Don't you just love God? He's saying, listen, I'm trying to make room at the table for everyone. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what's going on in your life. If you can't bring me, if you cannot bring the goat, 
then you can bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. And if you can't bring the two turtle doves and you can't bring the two pigeons, I still want to make a place at my table for you. I want you to be able to receive the forgiveness for the sins you've committed. He says, you know what? If you can't bring that, then bring an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. Can you believe this? It's just God saying, you know what? I want you to be with me. And if you'll just come and humble yourself before me and confess your sin, I will be faithful and just to forgive your sin. It's not about how expensive the offering is that you bring. What it is that I really want, I don't desire the sacrifices. What I really want is a repentant, contrite heart that's honestly coming before me saying, Lord, I don't want to live like this no more. I don't want to be in this sin no more. I don't want to keep doing these things anymore. I need to be right with you. I want you to make atonement before me because I want the separation between me and God to be gone. I don't want to live in slavery to sin no more, but instead I want to be free. God, I'm bringing this offering to you. Someone in the chat says it also shows that the salvation isn't in the offering at all. Amen. Amen. You got that right. Alyssa, thank you for that. Friends, did you hear what Alyssa just put down in the chat? This shows that the salvation isn't in the offering at all. No. The salvation is in Christ which the offering is a type of. It's pointing to the Savior whose righteousness is going to be an atonement for sin once and for all, for all time. Okay, then we get into the guilt offering. If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord of his compensation a ram without blemish, out of the flock, valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary for a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth to it, and give it to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. What is this talking about? Okay, it's saying, if you do something that has caused a financial harm, to someone else, if you've stolen something from someone, if you've killed a neighbor's animal, if you've done anything that has caused financial harm against another person, not only do you need to bring the offering, but you need to repay the person for the wrong that you've done plus a fifth. In other words, not only are you going to pay them back for the thing that you took from them or the thing that you caused them to lose or whatever sin it is that you've committed against them financially, but you're going to give them more than what you took from them. Cindy Jackson says, we know that, but putting it into words is powerful. That's right. Yes, putting it into words is very powerful. Okay, so friends, that is the end of our Leviticus reading for today. We had read Leviticus 4, verse 1 through 519. Listen, it's easy to read Leviticus and start thinking, okay, this is boring. Why am I reading about all of these sacrifices that we don't even do anymore, right? But I want to point something out to you guys. When we intentionally read this and we think about the contemporary application of Leviticus, we end up seeing the parallels between what God is teaching the people of Israel and what it is that he's trying to actually point us to in the New Testament. And so now let's go ahead and move to the reading that we did from the Gospel of Mark, and we are going to see parallels. Okay, here we go. Gospel of Mark. What did we read today? We read Mark 2, verse 13, through chapter 3, verse 6, didn't we? Mark chapter 2, verse 13, through Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Are we, guys, are we all ready to go to the New Testament now, friends? 
Okay, here we go. He went out again beside the sea. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, Oh, don't you love this part? And when Jesus heard them questioning and saying, Hey, disciples of Jesus, why is he hanging out with those dirty, rotten sinners and tax collectors? And when Jesus heard them saying this, he answered them. Gotta love this answer here. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. See, now friends, let me explain something to you here. The scribes and the Pharisees claimed to be righteous and they claimed that they had no need of repentance. Remember when John the Baptist came teaching in the wilderness, crying, repent, be baptized by water, prepare the way for the Lord is coming, right? And the Pharisees and the scribes came out to listen to John's preaching, but did did they repent? Did they receive the baptism? Were they willing to have the way prepared for the Lord? No, because they thought, well, pfft. We have Moses. We have Abraham and Isaac. We're the scribes and the Pharisees. We don't need to repent of anything. We've kept the law from our youth. And look at us. We're blessed by God. We have no need of this Savior that you're talking about. The scribes and the Pharisees claim to be righteous and have no need to repent. And what Jesus was saying to them is, Listen, I came for those who are sinners in need of a Savior. I came for those who are humble enough to repent. I came for those that recognize that they are sinners and that they have a need for the righteousness that I am offering. And oh, friends, when we go on in Mark, we see a story coming in the very near future, which ends up helping us to see very clearly what the gospel of Mark is pointing at here. Right? Because what happens next? The Pharisees are now questioning the disciples about fasting. Hey, hey, John's John's disciples are fasting. The Pharisees' disciples are fasting. Why aren't you? And then, ooh, the disciples are caught picking grain on the Sabbath. What does Jesus say? Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus is now claiming to be in charge of the Sabbath? This is good news for you and me because, friends, the scribes and the Pharisees had 600 laws. 600 additional laws that they had added to the book of Moses to let you know exactly what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. Can you imagine trying to remember 600 rules for keeping Sabbath? Can you imagine trying to remember 600 rules? And Jesus says, hey, hey, you guys got this thing backwards. The Sabbath was not made. Or the Sabbath was made. Sorry. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath is made for man. It's a gift for you, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's saying, hey, by the way, guys, I'm the one that created the Sabbath. And I hallowed it. Which means I'm for you and I drew close I, I draw I draw close to mankind on the Sabbath. Jesus created the Sabbath time. He hallowed the Sabbath time. He sanctified the Sabbath time. So that he would have the right to draw close to us. So that dominion of God would be possible during those Sabbath hours. And how do I know that? 
We see it in the next story. Are you guys ready for what I'm about to tell you? If you don't hear anything else I say today, you need to understand what is about to be proclaimed in this next story. Are we ready for it? Fasten your seatbelts and get ready because Jesus is about to do something that is going to really offend the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Well, how do they how do they know that they can try to draw Jesus into a trap? Because Jesus just claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus just said he defended the disciples who were being attacked by the scribes and Pharisees for picking grain on the Sabbath, right? You all did the reading, right? Mark chapter 2, verse 23, one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Right? So within their 600 rules they had made for the Sabbath, right, their book of 600 rules that they had made for the Sabbath, they had said, hey, by the way, you can't pick grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, hey, listen, you guys don't understand the Sabbath at all because the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is supposed to be a day that is a blessing to you, not a curse. You've turned the blessing that I gave mankind into a curse. And then this story happens. Are we ready? Is everyone buckled their seatbelts? I'm going to need to see some thumbs up in the chat if you're ready for Mark chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. Very short story. <laughs> Alyssa says, man, legalism is exhausting. You better believe that. Okay, here we go. How many of you are ready by a show of hands for Mark chapter 3? Annie, you got your thumb up. Is anybody else ready for what I'm about to throw down? Melissa's ready. Christian's ready. Crown Point Writer is ready. Edlene is ready. Cindy is ready. Okay, we're ready. We got people. We're engaged. Here we go. Get ready. Danielle Clayville, you are in the house. Lynn Rydell, you are in the house. Chuck Baby in the house. Naomi from Australia in the house. We are ready. Buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. Again. <laughs> Jesus entered the synagogue. When? When was he entering the synagogue? Again, he entered the synagogue. What day was it? First, they're out in the grain field. Jesus proclaims to them, by the way, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And by the way, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then again, he entered the synagogue. When is he going into the synagogue? He's going into the house of God, right? And it's on the Sabbath. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Annie. It's on the Sabbath. Jesus is now going into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And why did people go into God's house on the Sabbath? Why did they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath? To open God's word to read it. And this is what happens. This is the drama, friends. And they watched Jesus to see whether or not he would heal a man who was there that had a withered hand. You see, they were like, ooh, I know what's going to happen here. Jesus is claiming to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And when he comes into the synagogue, there's a man in our synagogue who has a withered hand. And knowing that Jesus had been eating with sinners, knowing that Jesus had been sitting with tax collectors, knowing that Jesus had defended his disciples and said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees and the scribes are expecting something is going to happen. So as Jesus enters the synagogue on the Sabbath day and a man was there with a withered hand, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. So they thought they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? And what did the men do? Jesus answers, Jesus asks a very straightforward question. According to the law on the Sabbath, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? 
to save life or to kill? Challenging question, isn't it? Cindy Jackson says they were silent. Lynn Rydell, Melissa, they chimed in. They were silent. And here's where it is. He asks the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill a life? But they were silent. Does anyone want to tell me why they were silent? Does anyone have any idea why they were silent? Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Did you hear who they went and held counsel with? With the Herodians. Now who is sitting with sinners? You see how the tables have turned? Jesus asked them a question they couldn't answer because they knew if they answered, it would actually prove him guiltless in healing the man. They knew if they said anything, that it would actually point to the fact that if the man was healed, that Jesus actually had the power to forgive sin. Because they believed that the man with the withered hand had a withered hand because of sin. And if Jesus was able to speak and to heal the man, it would mean that not only was the man's hand restored, but the man was now in right standing with God and was no longer a sinner. Do you hear what I'm saying? And in the moment that they saw clear evidence of the fact that Jesus not only had the power to heal, but that he also had the power to forgive sin, they left and the same people who were accusing Jesus of sitting with tax collectors and sinners were now sitting with Herodians planning to kill Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? The first accusation that we read about that they made against Jesus is he's sitting with tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus proves, not only does he say that I came to forgive sinners, not only does he say that I came on behalf of those, he says, hey, I didn't come for people who've got it all together. I didn't come for righteous people, but instead I'm a physician who came for the sick people. I'm a physician who came for the sinners. I'm a person who came for those who have a need to repent, to be forgiven, to be healed, who have need of a doctor. And these very same people who were accusing him of eating with sinners were now sitting with sinners plotting to kill him because he had proven to them and he had questioned them and they had to be silent because they knew if they answered his question, they would condemn themselves. Jesus had proven a better lawyer of the law than they, and it's because he wrote the law with his very own hand. <laughs> you couldn't argue the law with the one who is the word, who was in the beginning, who was with God, who was God, who was now Emmanuel standing there in the flesh. You couldn't argue with him. Why? Because Jesus is the best defense lawyer of all time. And he's also the best prosecutor of all time. And the judgment, my friends, is good news. Because when Jesus comes, he is coming to pronounce judgment on Satan and his angels and to destroy them in hellfire and to rid the universe of the penalty of sin forever. And all who put their faith in Jesus are putting their faith in the one who created the earth in six days and who also made the Sabbath day and hallowed it 
and sanctified it. And also, when you come to Jesus, you're coming to the one who has the power to forgive sin and to heal you of the consequence of it. Following Jesus is the way. It is the truth. It is the life for all who believe because the Jesus that I follow is revealed right here in this word as being the one who is the one who created the world, who made the Sabbath as a blessing. Friends, I want to tell you right now, we got to keep the Sabbath day. And it's not because God is trying to see whether or not we keep the Sabbath day and the 600 rules or whatever else. Keeping the Sabbath day means coming into the rest of Jesus's righteousness and salvation and his sacrifice that he made on our behalf. I don't come to church to try to keep rules. I don't keep the Sabbath day to try to make sure that I keep the Sabbath, but I come to church to be with Jesus because Jesus is the only one who has ever kept the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is my righteousness because I'm a sinner. He is the one that I have to come to because I am a sick man in need of a savior. I need to come to the hospital. I need to be in the house of prayer. I need to make my petitions and my praises before God because I serve a God who loves me so much that he created a Sabbath day and he hallowed it because he wanted to be close to me. He wanted me to know that he is for me. He wanted me to know that he sanctified that day so that on that day that Jesus would have dominion so that the devil would not have power so that his kingdom could come and his will could be done on the Sabbath day. Friends, Jesus wants to reach out and touch you. Jesus wants you to reach out and touch the hem of his garment on that Sabbath day. Jesus wants you to come into the Sabbath rest that he made for you before time began. Why? Because he wanted to have a place where he could draw close to you and heal you and forgive you and give you the forgiveness of sin that's talked about in Leviticus like we read today. He wants you to be able to come to a place to confess your sin, to repent of your need, to tell him of your sickness, to tell him of your financial trouble, to let him know what it is you need because Jesus Watches you to reach out and touch him. He wants to reach out and touch you. He wanted to make sure that there would be one day in every week where he would have dominion to heal us. The church is the ICU. It is the hospital. And we need to be there because we need Jesus. You know what? He did not make the Sabbath as a curse. He did not make man for the Sabbath, but instead he made the Sabbath for man so that there would be a space in time when Jesus could give us grace and mercy and forgiveness and atonement before God the Father in unlimited measure. Are you now seeing how what you read in Leviticus today ties to what you read in the book of Mark? Am I the only one that's picking up the picture here? I hope you guys are picking up what I'm trying to put down that God has shown us in his word today. The high priest, Jesus Christ, wants to make atonement for you and I. Hello, Jennifer Jill. So glad that you could join us for our Bible in a year challenge right now. We have been talking about Mark chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 where we see the beautiful story of Jesus healing the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath, showing once and for all that the Lord we serve, Jesus Christ, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he is the doctor who wants us to know that he created his Sabbath day as a day that he hallowed because he wants to be with us. He wants to be for us and he sanctified it so that the dominion of God could be poured out with unlimited favor on God's people and friends. The house of God is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. Our doors should be open, and people should be able to come boldly before the throne of grace. I don't care who you are. The throne of grace is available for you. If Jesus can sit with tax collectors and sinners, then I can tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus wants to sit with you. Jesus wants to meet your need. Jesus wants to heal you. Jesus wants to forgive you in response to the sins that you need to repent of. You can come to Jesus because he's the high priest who wants to make atonement for you before 
God the Father, he wants to set the record straight. He wants to clean your life up and he wants to heal you. Now, I hope that's good news for everybody listening today. Let's move on. I've got to get to an appointment here in 20 minutes because I am going to visit some people tonight for dinner at their house. It's going to be fun. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, can we just start in Psalm 36, verse 5? Let's just start there. I've only got 20 minutes to be where I need to be, so I'm starting in Psalm 36, verse 5. Psalm 36, verse 5. Let's check it out. I love this word, steadfast love. How many of you love that word, steadfast love? Don't you just love the fact that the Lord's love towards us is steadfast? His love is unwavering. His love is unchanging. His love is unalterable. His love is for us. His love is consistent. His love is steady. It don't stop. It's steadfast. It's coming for you. And here we go. Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Oh, man. He's got so much steadfast love that if you could measure this stuff square cubed, you'd have so much of it, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountain of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. Hey, God's good to man and beast alike. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. I love that. How many of you want to hide under the shadow of God's wings? That's the promise that I'm claiming today. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. I'm claiming the promise that I can take refuge in the shadow of the Lord's wings. I may live in a world where the prince of darkness is shaking his chains and trying to cause trouble and trying to mess me up and trying to lead me into temptation, but I'm choosing to hide under the shadow of the wings of the one who has steadfast love towards me that extends to higher than the heavens above and it goes further than the depths of the ocean below. The feast on the abundance of your house. They feast. Those who trust in the Lord feast on the abundance of your house. D do the children that put their faith in the Lord ever beg bread? No, no, no. No, no, no. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Oh, friends, do you pick up what the psalmist is putting down? In your light, Jesus, that's where we actually see light. Everything else, <laughs> that pales in comparison to you. The real light, in your light, Jesus, that's where we see the real light. Gets exciting, doesn't it? Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. Friends, what is it all about? It's all about knowing Jesus, isn't it? Lord, you know me. Continue your steadfast love for me. How many want to claim that promise today? Lord, I know you. Lord, you know me. And I want, I just want to claim the promise that because I know you, your steadfast love continues towards me. It is continual. It never stops. It never runs out. The love of God towards you is overflowing. It never runs out. That's good news. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away from you, O Lord. Oh, do you hear what I'm picking up now? Arrogant scribes and Pharisees trying to drive people away from Jesus. And the psalmist says, Let not the foot of the arrogance come upon me. Not, let not the hand of those wicked people drive me away from you. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Here's the thing. The Lord can protect us from those who try to drive us away from him. Okay, here we go. Here's our proverb, and I've got to fly. I can't believe this. Oh, my word, it's 615. Danielle says, shadow of the Lord's wings, the presence of God as in the most holy place. Love it. Absolutely. 110%. Thank you for that comment. Proverbs 10, 1 and 2. Here we go. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. 
How many mothers can say amen to this? You're praying for your sons. You're praying for your daughters to live by the Holy Spirit rather than by the foolishness of the ways of this world because I'm going to tell you something. When we follow the knowledge of man and the ways of this world, it is a sorrow to our mothers, isn't it? Verse 2, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. Friends, if we're out there living by the knowledge of man and we're gaining financial profit from it, what do we really have in the end? What will a man or woman give for their soul? I mean, that's really the question. The devil always tries to make gain that we can get through wickedness and lawlessness look very appealing. But if we gain the things of this world through wickedness, we've gained nothing because in the end, all that we had is gone when we die the second death. It's not worth it. All the devil can do is deceive and lead to death while the law of God is the truth, the light which leads to life. Okay. And what does it say? Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. And here's the last words for today. But righteousness delivers from death. Friends, how many of you want to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ today? The only thing that delivers the soul from death and gives us the hope that we have in Jesus of not only living a life in this world, but living life abundantly, seeing his kingdom come and his will be done in our life, and having eternal life. Because what does Psalm 23 say? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Bible in a Year, day 48 of 365. I want to thank you for each and every single person who has joined me for the Instagram Live. Lord, continue to pour out your Holy Spirit in our lives. Continue to help us to see your word. Plant your word in our hearts like seed. Grow a great harvest in us, Lord. May you be lifted up so that all men and women will be drawn to you. And Lord, please be with us until we come together again tomorrow for day 49 Thank you so much that we've made it through 48 days of 365 in our Bible in a Year Challenge and that we have been blessed by the promises that we have found in your word. I want to claim those promises for each and every single person that is listening to the sound of my voice and that will watch this video later on. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. I hope today was a wonderful day. I am off to dinner. I love all of you. I am praying for all of you. And as always... As I always say at the end of almost every live, please pray for me. I need your prayers. Life is not easy. And I just want to do one thing. I want to be faithful to the calling that God has placed on my life. Will you pray for that for me today? That God will give me the courage and the strength to continue to be faithful to God's will. I just want to do God's will. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful night and I will see you tomorrow.